this is a slide that unfortunately is all too familiar, a graph that's unfortunately very common. This is a, a typical pattern of uh, response and, and relapse uh, and progression and the development of acquired resistance in a woman with uh, high grade serous ovarian cancer. And we've seen this depicted in different ways now already today. But you can see that um, this is a, a typical case in terms of in terms of the in terms of how she has initially a good response to treatment and then in this period of remission and then um, uh, a recurrence and then more chemotherapy but it, the cancer progressively becomes resistant to treatment and, and unfortunately she dies at this point but as Penny nicely pointed out um, you can learn a lot from diving down into the data and looking at exceptions to the rule and for a number of years we've been very interested in patients like this one so this is a woman with ostensibly the same disease high grade serous ovarian cancer and you can see that she's had surgery and, and uh, first line chemotherapy she's had non she's had surgery but uh, unfortunately she's been non optimally debulked she's had residual disease so she hasn't been cured of her disease but quite remarkably she's had this uh, extraordinary response to treatment, her CA125 has fallen profoundly and then it stayed down for a number of years. And so these exceptional response patients um, I think can tell us a lot about uh, what are the molecular or even lifestyle or immunological circumstances that allow these unusual patients uh, to do so well. And this is an area more generally in oncology that's received quite a bit of attention in the last couple of years, not just in ovarian cancer, but in other, um, other solid and liquid cancers. And there's, in fact, an initiative of the National Cancer Institute to try and accrue patients like these and, and, and learn from these um, exceptional cases. So the study I'm going to tell you about, and I'll just show some of the data on it, has been very much a collaboration with Anna DePazio's lab and I had the original idea when we started the Australian Ovarian Cancer Study, which has been mentioned a few times, to try and, um, try and understand what was going on in these very unusual cases. And, and the, the sort of the arms and legs, I guess, of the work particularly have been, has been led by Dale Garsed and Catherine Alsop, two very talented postdocs uh, in my lab in this ongoing collaboration with people in uh, Anna's lab. And, and Actually, a number of the people in this room who have participated in accruing these patients. And it's been uh, funded through support from the NHMRC and, and OCA's support of the Australian Ovarian Cancer Study, uh, DOD, as you'll hear, and, and of course, um, essentially all the members of, of ANSCOG. So I just wanted to add that right at the beginning. So Really, um, because these patients are exceptional, it's very important to have large numbers of patients to draw on to find um, a substantial number of them to try and develop any statistically sort of rigorous associations when you start to do things that are testing many variables like uh, whole genome sequencing it or even panel uh, uh, sequencing, as I'll show you in a moment. And so, what we did was that we drew on the Australian Ovarian Cancer Study, which had thousands of patients recruited and also the Westmead Gynecological Oncology Biobank and starting with about uh, a little over 2,000 patients with invasive disease we whittled it down to around about 100 patients that had high-grade serous ovarian cancer we felt that it was very important to focus on a single histological subtype because as we've learned over the years ovarian cancer is a very diverse disease and if you mix the different histologies you get you very much blur the signal uh, in the data. So we're able to cull them from these two large cohorts and start to work our way through them and try to understand what was going on. So one of the first things that you need to do is to make sure that they are as labelled and, and really make sure that they're in fact high-grade serous ovarian cancer patients. When, even with a, a small rate of misclassification, when you filtering so heavily from thousands of patients down to just a hundred. Uh, even if a few slipped through, it could really uh, confound the data. And so we've analysed these patients sort of and their the tumour samples back and forward 
looking both um, by pathology review using conventional pathology classification, but also some of the more recent molecular criteria that are typical of high grade serous cancers. And so what's shown here is um, a copy number plot of uh, genome wide change in gains and losses um, in the, the tumor samples. And we can see in these examples here that the, this is a pattern of extensive copy number change that's very typical of high-grade serous cancers and acts as a useful discriminator between low-grade serous cancers, which are the main problem in terms of misclassification. We we'll also use these criteria here, pathogenic P53 mutations a number of years ago, um, collaboration with James Brenton, we showed that these cancers almost 100% of them, 98, 97% of them have p53 mutations, uh, either as, which can either be seen molecularly as a mutation in the gene or through p53 staining. Martin Cabell and others have shown that they should express WT1. Um, and we've excluded cases that have the molecular changes that are typical of low grade serous cancers, um, particularly point mutations in genes such as KRAS or NRAS or BRAF. And from the cohort, we excluded eight of these sort of um, low grades in high grade, sort of um, uh, appearing as high grade tumors. And, and also excluded a few cases where, um, where we, we lacked sufficient clinical information. And in fact, we started with 127, and through this kind of further filtering, uh, that's where, how we ended up with the 96. So one of the observations that we made, which I think is really intriguing, is that there are different ways that you can be exceptional in this setting. Um, to some extent, we geared the study to try and tease this out, but it really did fall out from the data that patients could be unusual in either having a very long period of remission after first-line treatment, a long progression-free survival, there were these patients that the clinicians also knew about who were unusual, not so much in the length of remission, but the fact that they continued to respond to platinum-based treatment. And so um, we call those the multiple responders. These are the long PFS group. And then patients could just survive a long time. And, and what we tried to do was to put some statistical measures around these. So we were very interested in patients who had a PFS that was more than two standard deviations beyond the mean for similarly staged patients in AOCS. Um, only a few percent of patients had three or more objective responses uh, to, to platinum-based treatment. And, and the, uh, again, the outliers, the two standard deviations um, for long survival was at around about, just by coincidence, 10 years. Uh, in the in the ASCS series, and you can see the intersection of these groups. So they're they're overlapping. Very few of the patients who are multiple responders come through the long-term survivors, but as you might guess, those with a long progression-free survival have uh, many of those become long-term survivors. I would say though that there are in the in, we've just written this work up and about to submit it, and if you look through the CA125 plots for each of these patients. There's, there's a great deal of diversity, and so there can in fact be long-term survivors who don't necessarily have a long progression-free survival, but uh, may turn out to continue to respond to, to therapy, or there are occasional cases which have a very sort of typical pathway and things are not looking very good, and then may have a very unusual response to even third or fourth line uh, treatment. So there's a great deal of diversity here. So one of the things that we wanted to do was to try and understand the intersection of BRCA mutations and, and other mutations in the HR pathway um, with this long-term survival phenotype. It's been known for a number of years that patients who carry germline or somatic mutations in BRCA1 or 2 generally have better responses to treatment. The more recent analysis of those patients suggests that that, that long term, that, that favourable response to treatment, at least for BRCA1 patients, doesn't pers persist, so it tends to be more of a medium term phenotype, although patients with BRCA2 mutations tend to be also more often long term survivors at 10 years, but really starting not so much with the mutation, but with the, um, with the, this phenotype, we wanted to, I think this has gone off, 
um, we wanted to see how these mutations would play out in this particular group of patients. And so this is just a summary of both the germline and somatic mutations that we've seen in these three groups. You can see that they're enriched, as you've heard today. Uh, we would expect about 50% of the patients would have either a somatic or a germline mutation. You can see that particularly in the multiple responders, um, over 75% carry one of these mutations. <coughs> That's also true in the long-term survivors and the long PFS groups, perhaps a little bit less, but certainly more than that 50%. What's also striking, though, is that um, there's a significant fraction of them where we were, weren't able to find either a germline or a somatic mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2 or other genes that we associate with the HR pathway or with methylation of genes that are known to be uh, methylated and inactivated. So something's going on with a wild type group here that we don't really understand. I think um, it's sort of the initial response to this might be, well, we already knew that BRCA mutations were associated with a favourable outcome. Um, why are we surprised by this? But this is data from Kath Allsop's JCO paper in uh, 2012. And I just want to point out that it, although patients with BRCA mutations as a group do better in terms of their um, median um, survival, this is overall survival, this is progression-free survival data, the overall survival data would look very similar. So this is non-carriers versus carriers. You can see that there's a significant fraction of patients down here with BRCA mutations that don't do very well at all. And then there's this group up here that, that do extremely well. So what that suggests is that although mutations in this pathway are clearly important in terms of initial response to treatment and perhaps long-term response, something else must be operative that perhaps acts in conjunction with these mutations to make them exceptional. So a, a year or two, or a couple of years ago, we did a, a whole genome sequence analysis on uh, a little over 90 patients, including 12 uh, of these extreme responder patients, these exceptional responder patients. And we were able to use this whole genome data to try and just get very small numbers, but try and get an indication of what other genes might be important in determining uh, this exceptional response. And what we saw, again the numbers were very small, was that there was a very interesting co-occurrence between inactivation of a tumour suppressor gene called RB1 and uh, coincident uh, mutation in, um, in uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2. And this was particularly confined to patients who had a very long progression-free survival, especially in the patients that, had, that were non-optimally debulked, suggestive that there was something about their cancer that made it extremely chemosensitive. And so this, this observation with RB really caught our attention. And so we then went to try and expand on this by doing immunohistochemistry uh, on the cohort and comparing it to a, a group of unselected patients shown over here. And again, what we found was that the patients who had this extreme response to chemotherapy, these are the extreme response A group, so these are the patients who are non-optimally debulked, they were the ones that had the greatest enrichment of this RB inactivation. This was work done in collaboration with Martin Cabell in Calgary. And so this is just the Kaplan-Meier analysis of, of the patients. And, and they're progression free and overall survival. And you can see in blue the patients where RB is absent have both a, a more durable response to treatment and a more favourable overall survival. And what I'm not showing here, but more recent collaboration with Susan Ramos using RNA seq data on again an independent data set shows that this is validated again that patients with RB loss either at the immunohistochemical level or at the RNA expression level uh, also have a better survival. So what we think might be going on in at least some of these patients is that from the patient's point of view they've kind of won the, the um, therapeutic jackpot. That There's a sort of a chance co-occurrence uh, of in this case mutations in the HR pathway and in RB that make the cancer particularly chemosensitive. We think that in other patients um, that there are other things that might be operative. I've not shown the data, but we think that, that there's 
it's been seen before, but some of these patients have particularly florid immunological responses in their tumours. Others have very high levels of uh, key 67 staining, a marker of proliferation. So we think that there are different circumstances that come together that are unusual, improbable, and that's why they're exceptional, but perhaps that make them very sensitive to chemotherapy. Um, I should say that this is, um, again, validated. I should, should have shown this earlier. Um, in a study from uh, Pat Shaw uh, of quite a large series of high-grade serious cancer patients stained for a number of markers, showed that RB1 loss was associated with longer overall survival and, and progression-free survival. And perhaps this actually extends to other solid cancers. So this is data in lung cancer where only about 15% of lung adenocarcinoma show loss of uh, RB, but the hazard ratio for loss of RB um, in following platinum-based treatment is 0.21, so it's really quite remarkable there. So there seems to be something very important about RB loss and platinum in terms of a very favourable response to treatment. How we might take this data and turn it into a sort of a drug strategy is something that we're pondering at the moment and to try and validate it with further functional studies. So just to sort of sum up then, what we're seeing in these exceptional responders are different patterns of response. There's no one way to become a long-term su survivor. Uh, they have frequent inactivation of the homologous recombination repair pathway, but we think that other genes need to act in, in concert with that to, to really get full, full benefit of that. We, don't, we need to understand these short-term survivors, and this is a study that uh, Ali Freeman uh, will be starting uh, in our lab, and they'll provide um, a very, these are patients with BRCA mutations that have very short survival, and they'll provide a very interesting comparator group. Uh, what's driving long-term survival in these apparently wild-type cases? Um, to what extent it's a confluence of these multiple factors, and as I said, I've not shown you the immune response data, but we think that that also is an important intersecting driver of in these patients. And so where this is going now is that this is part of an international consortium, or one of at least two international consortia to study exceptional response in high grade serious cancer patients. Ours is called MOCOG. It's supported by uh, the US Department of Defense. We're looking at the intersection of immune, uh, genomic, and epidemiological and lifestyle factors involving many people. They suggest the PIs for the different groups. There are obviously many more people involved than that. And what we also endeavour to do is to take the things that are coming out of these exceptional responses to conventional treatment and see whether they're relevant to uh, PARP. Uh, as Jonathan mentioned, we're seeing some patients that have very durable response to PARP inhibitors, see whether the things that we find here are relevant here or vice versa for that matter. Um, I'm actually missing my last acknowledgement slides. I think many of the people, in fact most of the people involved in ANSCOG um, and, and of course the patients have contributed to these studies over the years and I'd just like to add my thanks uh, to them. Thank you very much.